Good morning, Emmanuel. Hang on, I know I'm undone. I'm not, I'm not uh, amplified. There we go. Good morning, Emmanuel. It is good to see you on this Labor Day weekend. And um, I just want us to take a moment, as is our new custom here, I guess since I've been here, to reconcile ourselves one to another because we are a community of faith and offer the sign of peace. So how we do that is we can stand, you can offer peace be with you, peace be with you, peace be with you. And then when we've done that and, and offered peace to one another, then you will turn to me and you will say, peace be with you, and I will say, and also with you. All right, you may begin. Peace be with you. Peace be with you, Emily. Thank you. Thank you so much, sweetie. My story. Okay. Are you ready? Yes. Okay. You say to me. Peace be with you. Oh, is it is it facing you? Yeah, that'll be better for me anyway. Okay, so I am Reverend Brenda Torrey, and I am ordained in the United Methodist Church, and I'm here on contract for another six months. So uh, my pronouns are she, her, and hers, and I just want to let you know something. I want to let you know that your presence here today changes things. It changes the world by the act of inviting God into your heart and your thoughts and your community. And we all say, amen. Uh, can you hear? Am I a little muffled? Arthur, I'm a little muffled. I, I sound a little echoey, I think. In that loop, you're doing well? Back there, you're doing well? You might have to move back a little, Rod. There it, there it goes. I think that's perfect. All right. Okay, Edith. Even when we encounter folks who we find mean, dishonest, hateful, we are called to respond with the love which is true and sincere. God calls us to love all people as if they were our siblings. For God seeks to weave us into one family, tearing down all barriers between us. No matter how weary we become from our loneliness, our struggles, our service, God challenges us to be patient, to rejoice, and to never stop praying. Why should we do all these things? Because we are God's people called to lives which are different and which make a difference. All right, let's stand and join in the hymn. Come in, come in and sit down. I don't think we've sung that in a little while. And it's Voices United, number 395. <laughs>
from Romans 12, 9 to 21. Love should be shown without pretending. Hate evil and hold on to what is good. Love each other like the members of your family. Be the best at showing honor to each other. Don't hesitate to be enthusiastic. Be on fire in the spirit as you serve the Lord. Be happy in your hope. Stand your ground when you are in trouble. Devote yourselves in prayer. Contribute to the needs of God's people and welcome strangers in your home. Bless people who harass you. Bless and don't curse them. Be happy with those who are happy and cry with those who are crying. Consider everyone as equal and don't think that you are better than anyone else. Instead, associate with people who have no status. Don't think that you're so smart. Don't pay back anyone for, evil, for, e for their evil actions with evil actions, but show respect for what everyone else believes is good. If possible, to the best of your ability, live at peace with all people. Don't try to get revenge for yourself, my dear friends, but leave room for God's wrath. It is written, revenge belongs to me. I will pay it back, says the Lord. Instead, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him a drink. By doing this, you will pile burning coals of fire upon his head. Don't be defeated by evil, but defeat evil with good. And the gospel reading this morning is from Matthew 16, 21 to 28, from the Common English Bible. From that time, Jesus began to show his disciples that he had to go to Jerusalem and suffer many things from the elders, chief priests, and legal experts, and that he had to be killed and raised on the third day. Then Peter took hold of Jesus, scolding him, and began to correct him. God forbid, Lord, this won't happen to you. But Jesus turned to Peter and said, get behind me, Satan. You are a stone that could make me stumble, for you are not thinking God's thoughts, but human thoughts. Then Jesus said to his disciples, all who want to come after me must say no to themselves, 
take up their cross and follow me. All who want to save their lives will lose them, but all who lose their lives because of me will find them. Why would people gain the whole world but lose their lives? What, what will people give in exchange for their lives? For the human one is about to come with the majesty of his father, with his angels. And then he will repay each one for, that per, what, for what that person has done. I assure you that some standing here won't die before they see the human one coming into his kingdom. Herein lies wisdom. Thanks be to God. Okay, so I know that sometimes when the children are here, I will, uh, are not here, I will do a story for all ages, but this Sunday I am not going to do that for uh, a, a few different reasons. So we'll all stand as we are able and sing our centering hymn, Lord, Listen to Your Children. So full disclosure, I don't really touch too much on the Matthew reading this morning in the sermon. Um, I did include it because I alluded to it last Sunday in my sermon and, uh, and thought it was important for our continuation in uh, the Gospel of Matthew. Someone, someone's being mean to my baby sister. I called her this week to work out some details for her wedding. And of course, as her big sister, I hang up from our call and begin to dream up of all the ways I could avenge her troubles. Now this is supposed to be a time of carefree living for her, being in love and marrying a truly wonderful man. She ought to be anticipating the wedding and the celebration of their love. But here she is. There is no other way to describe it. These people are mean-spirited, perhaps incredibly unhappy, and are trying to make those within their orbit join the uneasiness carousel. In the meantime, my sister is hanging in there, offering the service owed to the people who are bound and determined to sabotage her. But she needs to see it through. Now, a fellow named Doug Bratt says, Paul counsels his readers to be patient in affliction. Not so easy, huh? Some of the affliction God's adopted sons and daughters endure comes from people. So it's as if the apostle is inviting us to be patient, not just with afflictions, but also with people who cause them. Now, after I stopped daydreaming about how to avenge my sister's evildoers, I prayed for them. 
Um, it may not have been a perfect prayer, granted. But I got myself to the threshold, and I figure that God can handle the rest. So do you see what I did there? I recognized that I wasn't quite operating at Jesus' standard. I wasn't. I'm not. But I must admit that I still feel like I am a better person than those who are trying to make my sister's life miserable right now. In my imperfection, I am still loved by God. And so are the evildoers, as I would call them. And it's so easy to slip into a mindset of us and them. Right? We're doing a lot of that these days. Casting aside those I don't like or agree with or feel afflicted or hurt by. Now this poem by Marie Howe takes hold of some of our hidden secrets. It makes me squirm with discomfort because I know I have allowed myself to wander into the unholy thoughts of the speaker in this poem. And maybe we don't have a star market, and maybe we don't need a star market. The star market provides the stage for our thoughts. The poem's words bring our innermost, perhaps ungodly thoughts into view. And certainly the equality of the thoughts I shared with you earlier about me, bears some resemblance to the feelings in this poem. The Star Market by Marie Howe. The people Jesus loved were shopping at the Star Market yesterday. An old lead-colored man standing next to me at the checkout breathed so heavily I had to step back a few steps. And even after his bags were packed, he still stood, breathing hard and hawking into his hand. The feeble, the lame, I could hardly look at them. Shuffling through the aisles, they smelled of decay, as if the star market had declared a day off for the able-bodied. And I wandered in with the rest of them. Sour milk, bad meat, looking for cereal and spring water. Jesus must have been a saint, I said to myself, looking for my lost car in the parking lot, stumbling among the people who would have been lowered into rooms by ropes, who would have crept out of caves or crawled from the piles, called from the corners of public baths on their hands and knees, begging for mercy. If I touch only the hem of his garment, one woman thought, could I bear the look on his face when he wheels around? Shame. The woman touching the hem of his garment wears the look of shame. She feels shame for her need, the state of her distress, and perhaps how she appears. We feel shame when we are judged. And who, Jesus asks of those about to cast stones at an adulteress, who among us has not sinned? If we cast shame upon another, then it may be that we, like Marie Howe, we may be thinking a little too highly of ourselves, as Paul warns in verse 18. Paul's letter to the Romans opens with this verse. Love should be shown without pretending. David McCabe has, shared, um, has also shared in the idea of a stage. Right? I was saying that the poem is a bit of a, a stage or a, a backdrop for our feelings. For him, it is we who are like players on a stage. And he says, some translations render this verse as, let love be without hypocrisy. The adjective hypocritus is related to the noun often used 
for actors, ones who wear masks, and that Hippocrates. He suggests the adjective Hippocrates has connotations of pretentiousness in the term, notions of play acting or charade. I know I want to put my best face forward, and yet behind this face, I am masking thoughts akin to those in Marie Howe's poem. How brave of her, I think, to unmask herself, to strip bare her ugly thoughts to the world for them to be read. Now I ask, could we bear the look of another's face? Could we bear the look on another's face if our mask was pulled away? How did we get here? If the world is our stage, David McCabe posits, then our temptation is to sprout into self-authored superheroes and cast our enemies as world-wrecking wretches. We make the world a better place. They are destroying this place and corrupting all that used to be good. We know the right course for the best outcome. They are holding us back with their prejudices and naive nostalgia. And from Doug Bratt, North American culture is increasingly deeply divided. We find it very difficult to agree, agree on important matters regarding politics, theology, and science. But it seems to be, me to be an increasingly short step from disagreement to vilification. We more and more seem to label those with whom we disagree not as people who don't share our perspective on things, but as our enemies, if not evildoers. As a result, it can be very tempting to hate those with whom we disagree. And McCabe confesses, rarely would any of us admit these mental flitters out loud. Instead, we strive to curate a public image of our best selves, presuming that everyone ought to assess our actions based on our best intentions. Okay. So I'm going to release some of the tension here for a moment. Take a deep breath. Because it's getting a little warm in here, isn't it? One of the things we can note from Paul's letter is that it is addressed to the community. We know this because he uses the plural when addressing some of these issues. Love each other like the members of your family. Be, at, be the best at showing honor to each other. As a community, we work together. Mary Hinkle Shore can hear Paul warning, don't try this alone. Thank be to God. If we are trying to live in community as Jesus has modeled for us, then retaliation is bad for us. Yes, for us. And Shore wisely states, returning evil for evil has a way of escalating conflict and reinforcing the sense of righteous indignation on both sides, while showing hospitality to enemies is at least confusing to them and may disarm them altogether. Now, Dustin James gives us a biblical example of what disarming an evildoer looks like. It comes to us from Jesus' directive, and if someone wants to sue you and take your tunic, let them have your cloak as well. Here's Justin James. Jesus says, And if someone wants to sue you and take your tunic, let him have your cloak as well. The setting for this story is a debtor being dragged to court by their creditor to pay up. In Deuteronomy 24, 10 to 13, we learn that creditors who go to collect on their loans may not enter someone's home and take whatever they want, but they must wait outside and receive the debtor's outer cloak as collateral. 
The cloak, however, must be returned at night so the debtor is not literally left out in the cold. Emily, do you have a question, love? What is it? Let's listen, and then we'll see if we get the answer from this. Yeah? Yeah? Okay. Jesus is again addressing the poor when he says, and if someone wants to sue you and take your tunic, let him have your cloak as well. People who are used to being walked upon and abused, as the poor are. He's talking to people who are literally being sued and taken to court for the shirt off their back, sued for everything and unfairly. Are you hearing that, Emily? They're being sued unfairly. Wink says, this is Walter Wink, I suppose, indebtedness was a plague in first century Palestine. Jesus' parables are full of debtors struggling to salvage their lives. Heavy debt was not, however, a natural calamity that had overtaken the incompetent. Did we hear that? It was the direct consequence of Roman imperial policy. Emperors taxed the wealthy to fund their wars. The rich naturally sought non-liquid investments to hide their wealth. Land was best, but it was ancestral, ancestrally owned and passed down over generations, and no peasant would voluntarily relinquish it. High interest debt and constant taxation by the Roman government drove a system of oppression. By the time of Jesus, large estates owned by absentee landlords, anybody catching this? Are we hearing this? Managed by stewards and worked by tenant farmers, day laborers, and slaves. It is no accident that the first act of, act of Jewish revolutionaries in 66 Common Era was to burn the temple treasury where the record of debts was kept. So what exactly was Jesus up to in giving this kind of directive? How would it be helpful for someone to give the shirt off their back along with their cloak or their coat? Wouldn't they be naked? Yes. And this is, the, this is the massive creativity that Jesus calls us toward. Here's the significance of that sort of action, Walter Wink continued. Nakedness was taboo in Judaism. And if you go back into the Hebrew Bible, the Old Testament, you can hear that in the stories. And shame fell less on the naked party than on the person viewing or causing the nakedness. There, stand, there stands the creditor, covered with shame, the poor debtor's outer garment in the one hand, his undergarment, right, his undershirt, in the other. The tables have suddenly been turned on the creditor. The debtor had no hope of winning the case. The law was entirely in the creditor's favor. But the poor man has transcended this attempt to humiliate him. He has risen above shame. And at the same time, he has registered a stunning protest against the system that created his debt. He has said, in effect, you want my robe? Here, take everything. Now you've got all I have except my body. Is that what you will take next? Jesus is helping the oppressed to find employment, empowerment in their own brutal circumstance. And in the process, he is allowing the debtor to show, in public view, how the system they've created brutalized people into deeper and deeper poverty. On the surface, the creditor may be thinking, along with all onlookers, yes, this is a righteous act because we should all pay our debts and bring all accounts to zero, right? We even think that. And that sounds nice only if the system which has been created to lend and retrieve money is not intrinsically evil like it was 
in ancient Rome. By stripping naked for all to see and walking out of the courtroom, suddenly the brutality of the creditor and his system is exposed for what it's really doing and how it's really treating people. After the unmasking of evil, then there's a chance for renewal and repentance, change. And Jesus does all this without an ounce, an ounce of prescriptive violence. We're going to watch a video by Work of the People, and that will end this sermon. Let us love, comes the invitation from the beloved community, a community following Jesus so long that defined their whole beings by it. Let us love little children. They encouraged each other as if this love was something that was yet unknown and needed to be practiced like a baby carefully watching the footsteps of others until she finally discovers her own feet can move in this way, wobbly and imperfect, but still walking, still following in the way. Let us love little children not in word or in speech, but as if our whole bodies are learning this new grace. Let us be bold in learning this new movement, for we will falter, and it won't be perfect, just as we are not perfect. Little children, it will feel new and awkward, and it should. It should feel strange to twist and turn our bodies into love's possibility. To learn how to love in the way of Christ, who is still trying to encourage us to love one another. Let this be what defines us now, in this moment. Not so that they will know that we are Christians, but so that we know who that God's love abides. God's love abides in me. God's love abides in you. I am in you and you are in me. And this changes everything. That is our prayer right now. That we will come to believe enough that God's love abides in us and be so changed. Oh Christ, May it be so. Now, Nancy, I'm not sure how familiar we are with this hymn, True Faith Needs No Defense. Do you want to play it through and level? So let's stand. Nancy's going to play this through for us once. And um, just so that we can hear the music and then we will sing. So stand as you are able if you want right now. And it's more voices number 139.
may be seated. All right, well, you're one step ahead of everyone else when we sing that again. Keep that in mind. Please take a moment of silence to hold those you know needing our prayer and for those listed here before us. And we begin. Lord, help us to say no when the voice is speaking of building up investments in the things of the world. When you want us to invest ourselves in the ways of heaven, we say to the world and yes to you. Lord, help us to say no to what the world tells us we need in the accumulation of stuff when you want us to let go the stuff and rely on you instead. We say, Lord, help us to say no to the world, and yes to you. Lord, help us to say no to the quick fix and ready-made answer that patches the cracks when you long for us to take a lifetime to live and explore the questions. Lord, help us say no to the world, and yes to you. Lord, help us say no to throwing money at every problem of feeding the hungry with direct debts. When you wish we would live in a more equal relationship with those who are hungry in the world. And we say, Lord, help us say no to the world and yes to you. Lord, help us say no to the easy way the world wants that involves no pain or hardship. When you call us to carry crosses and trust the love that bears all. Lord, help us say no to the world and say yes. Lord, help us say no to conflict but show humanity at its worst, in blitz and repression, when you know we can live ways that show the magnificence of humanity. Lord, help us say no to the world and ask you. Lord, help us say no to a faith that speaks empty words and is borne by hollow actions when we know of a word that brings the fullness of life and is carried by actions shaped by justice. Now we'll move into our prayer of confession. God, we humble ourselves now in confession. We want to be followers of Jesus, though we do not always want to follow Jesus. We don't even want to listen to the conversation which our God has us. We prefer to indulge ourselves. We are merely to put the Lord on our cross. We do not invite you to our lives. We grasp that word of your words. Holy and loving God, forgive all our thoughts and actions that would protect us on the path of Christ and say, Now let us pray together in the words that Jesus taught us, saying, Our Mother and our Father, who art in heaven, I will be thy name, I will make you come, I will be down to the Lord's first message. He will set us free and come to the earth, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Let us move into our time of offering. I dwell upon the goodness in my life. Thank you. I cherish in my heart your gift to me. Thank you. I notice the blessings of life, breath, loving and sharing. I am so very grateful to you, God, and I respond to your love with this gift today. So there are many ways to donate this morning, and they will appear on the screen. And um, oh, do you want to just play it through me too? Yeah, Nancy will play through our offering hymn. 
Here's our prayer of thanksgiving. Your steadfast love is but one of the many gifts you pour into us. Our offerings are but a part of the ways in which we can serve you and your people. Bless them and bless us to ministries of lasting healing and enduring hope. Amen. And you do know our closing hymn is now Think We All Are God, Voices United, number 236 and you may stand as you are able. May you have the eyes of Jesus to see a world in need. May you have the feet of Jesus to bring good news in all kinds of ways. Go in peace, and God go with you. And we will sing Amen, Hallelujah. <laughs>
our new 